Now today I'd like to get right into the text of Ezra uh, for our sermon this morning. And let me, be uh, let me begin by saying that this chapter has uplifting narratives about the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And in this chapter, we see four distinct parts that make up the narrative. So first of all, in the chapter, we see the decree of Darius, the passage that we read together just before. And second, we see about the completion of the building. Third, dedication of the building. And lastly, celebration of the past over meal. So decree of Darius, completion of the building, dedication of the building, and celebration of the Passover. That's, the how, that's how the chapter is divided and arranged. And so we'll spend the rest of the time this morning looking into the details of these four parts. So first of all, let's look at the scroll or the decree from the King Darius in verses 1 and 12. And let me first of all read to you verses 1 and 2 and cover briefly some historical background as we begin our meditation. So going back to verse 1, chapter 6, King Darius then issued an order, and they searched in the archives stored in the treasury at Babylon, and a scroll was found in the citadel of Ekbaktana in the province of Medea. Now the place called Ekbaktana was an important city during this time, and one of its chief uses in terms of the city was to be used as summer residence for the Persian court. So uh, the Persian kings back then would usually live in Babylon during the winter, move to Susa during the spring, and then to Ekbaktana during the summer to enjoy the pleasant weather and other related pleasures. Uh, it's where we now call Western Iran, and it was chosen as the capital of Medea in the 8th century BC. So one of the reasons why we found, find that uh, the scroll or the parchment regarding the decree of Cyrus was found in the citadel of Ekbaktana was probably because the place was ideal for preserving those kinds of materials, letters and decrees and parchments. And so it's not surprising that the scroll was found or the decree was found uh, in that particular area. And then we go to verses 3 and 5 and find the exact measurements that the king Cyrus wanted the temple to be. And what we have here is essentially in agreement with what we find in chapter 1 from Cyrus's own decree. And although we have some more details here in chapter 6 about the exact sizes of the temple and other related details, one thing that's highlighted in both chapters, that is chapter 1 and chapter 6, is that the costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. Verse 3, the costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. And we just celebrated the opening of the reno renovated building down at All Nations um, uh, just last week. I'm just losing track of time now. Um, and I believe that the communication has been very clear that uh, there were some government grants that the church received that were to be used for the expansion and extension of the church building. And the government provided that money for the church community as well as the broader South Sudanese community living near the area. And we know that on the one hand, it's very difficult to secure funds for a building project like that. So on the one hand, I think it's a great thing that the government was willing to uh, contribute a significant amount of funds to the rebuilding project. And again, uh, just last week, we came together to celebrate the occasion as a community and as um, members who support that uh, church. Um, and here in Ezra, we also see that even the King Darius was committed to supporting the rebuilding of the temple. Um, but what's obviously different from our own context and here is that the level of commitment that this pagan king showed regarding the rebuilding project was so much higher. The dedication and commitment that this pagan king showed toward the rebuilding of the temple was, was far more greater 
than the kind of commitment that the government showed in supporting a church uh, building project like that we saw at All Nations. So look at verses 6 and 7. And here we see the intensity, the rigor, and the vigor of the commitment that these pagan kings showed. Verse 6, Now then, Tetanai, governor of Trans Euphrates, and Shethar Bozenai, and you other officials of that province, stay away from there. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. So it's clear, isn't it? Don't interfere with the work. Don't bother the people there. Let them do their own thing so that they can rebuild the house of God on its side. Don't try to move it to somewhere else. Don't try to interrupt it. Don't try to bother the people. Do whatever you can to support the work. And in that ancient legal context, the words stay away from there and do not interfere would also imply that no rejection or accusation would be accepted. So Darius is pretty much saying here that the governors here should not even try to object to this decree or to reject the decree or to come back to him and say, the king Darius, you have to reconsider this decree. Don't even think about that. Just do what I tell you to do. That's the kind of force that's implied in these expressions. Do not interfere and let them do what they need to do. And just to help you see why a foreign king, a pagan king, would be so dedicated to the rebuilding of the temple of Israel, I mean, as we look at this, we might be wondering, why is he that committed to this, you know, building project? And if you're ever wondering about that, perhaps I should remind you of the very opening words in chapter 1. Because there we find this record, record, which basically explains why foreign kings back then were so committed to this important project. Going back to verse 1, chapter 1, we read, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm. God moved the heart of Cyrus the Great. So the broader picture behind what's happening in the story of Ezra is that God was doing these things in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. God was moving the hearts of these pagan kings precisely to fulfill what he spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. And that's an important piece of the puzzle that we should keep in our minds because the relations between the state and the church back then, um, uh, the relations that we see here are not something that we can replicate in our own days in the exactly the same way because the context was obviously different. Back then, God was allowing all these things to happen precisely to fulfill the promise that God made through the prophet Jeremiah. So it was a special context. It was a special situation where the pagan kings were so committed to the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And as you read this particular decree or letter, you might be wondering about what you can learn or take away from this. Like, what can we learn from political kings committing themselves to this rebuilding project? Well, at the least, I want to say this, that we Christians need to be as zealous as these foreign kings when it comes to building up the body of Jesus Christ. We Christians need to be as zealous as these foreign kings when it comes to building up the body of Jesus Christ. Yes, on the one hand, we can read the story like this and give thanks to God that he moved the pagan kings, but that's not everything that we can learn and give thanks to God as we read this narrative. We should also be challenged to do and engage in this building project as Christians who have received God's grace, 
whom, whom God has already moved the hearts. And so we can go to, for example, the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 when he said, Well, speaking the truth in love, we all grow to become in every respect the mature body of Jesus Christ, who is the head, that is Christ. From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself in love as each part does its work. And how about 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Paul said, By the grace of God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So one important point that we can all draw from this part of the narrative in the book of Ezra is this challenge toward all of us. How zealous are you in building up the body of Christ right now? How zealous are you? How committed are you to this rebuilding project that God is doing here in Melbourne, here in uh, Knox Presbyterian Church? And are you okay when you see others, for example, attacking churches, uh, attacking Christian beliefs and values? Are you okay when you see the name of God being marked in the public sphere? And are you okay when you see people wandering off and ruining their souls by consuming bad beliefs and engaging in bad practices? Are you okay as a Christian? When churches are divided and damaged by false teachings and even by lack of good leadership, are you okay when you see churches suffer within, from within, and from without? And I'm not trying to encourage you to be angry all the time or disappointed all the time or be activists out there to do something active in the public sphere. Well, I'm just trying to encourage you to be zealous for the work of ministry. Um, you can be a Christian, of course, good Christian, uh, in your own private domains as an individual. And I trust that you are acting like a beacon of light in your private domains, in your relationship with family members, in your relationship with friends, and that's all very good. But how about this church? Uh, do you really care about building up this church? Even pagan kings were committed to the rebuilding of the temple. They were very vigorous in their commitment. And how about us as Christians? Um, are we expecting some other people to change their values and attitudes so that churches could be rebuilt and reinvigorated? Or can you do something um, to rebuild the temple, or sorry, uh, rebuild the church of Jesus Christ as a Christian living now? And one of my favorite theologian named J. Grissom Machen once made the point in his famous book called Christianity and Liberalism that a faithful church of Jesus Christ is the highest blessing that Christians can give to the world. A faithful church of Jesus Christ is the highest and the noblest blessing that Christians can give to this dark and uh, corrupted world. And so in that regard, do you have that kind of commitment to the gospel ministry? It does not have, does not have to uh, mean that you always sign up for something in events. Well, either in prayer, uh, offerings, or encouragement. I think it will be very important for all of us to think about how we can be zealous and how we can express that zeal toward others. So that we as Christians, as beneficiaries of God's grace, can be committed to this great building project that, is God, that God is doing here in this world. And to move on from this, we see the second part in the chapter, and that is about the completion of the building. And we go to verses 13 and 15 and find what happened in the construction site up until its very completion. And one thing I wanted to zoom in on was this interesting point in verse 14 that the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper 
under the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. They were continuing the project under the preaching of the chosen prophet, prophets. But I guess we can ask this question as we read this uh, verse here. Like, why did they need the preaching of God's word by Haggai and Zechariah when they were just building the temple? Um, wouldn't they just need a person like Zerubbabel, the governor, who, like a chief project manager there, who would give them directions about where to put stuff, how to build stuff, how to delegate tasks to different people? I mean, wasn't, wouldn't that be enough for the Jewish community to have a person like Zerubbabel who could govern the, 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 the building project? Why was it important to highlight this fact that the community continued and even prospered through the preaching ministry of these prophets. And I think if we go to Zechariah chapter 8, we find some helpful answers. And last week I read something from Haggai, but this time I want to read something from Zechariah chapter 8. And if we go there, we find these words, and I hope that these words would help you understand why a preaching ministry was a vital part of the community revitalization. So if we go to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 14 to 17, we find words like this. Just, this is God saying to Israel, Just as I had determined to bring disaster on you and show no pity when your ancestors angered me, so now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things that you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. Render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other. And do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. And I would say this, I would say that this is one of the many reasons why a faithful ministry of preaching is so essential in the communal life in the church of Jesus Christ. We can have leaders with lots and lots of practical insights about how to concentrate well in services, how to pray well in public, how to read the Bible well as an elder, as a leader, how to study the Bible well. We can have all great things about these practical issues. And I want to highlight that it's important to have people gifted in those areas. But I would still say, that without the preaching ministry that explains the meaning and significance of God's work, God's word and God's heart, without the preaching that explains the highest cause and aim of the Christian life, and without the preaching that recounts the saving work of God graciously performed His people, without the preaching that delivers the law of God and the gospel of God to His people, we will eventually lose our hearts toward Jesus and we will not walk on the righteous path that God wants us to walk on. The community of Israel back then and the church right now needed I still need a faithful preaching of God's word. And that's what's essential in building up the body of God's covenant people. We need a faithful preaching that delivers both the law and gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to hear them repeatedly, even when we are engaged in more practical stuff like building the temple or any other related tasks. So at the very least, let me ask you to, for, for example, pray for me as I prepare sermons every week for you and for those who might tune in to listen to it, watch it later on as well. Please pray that I'll be faithful to God's law and gospel recorded for us in the Holy Scriptures and pray for yourselves. I, I would like to encourage you to be more attentive to God speaking to you through the word, through my mouth, so that you can accept it as God's word, God's will to you, and shape your heart, shape your life around the truths that are spoken to you. I'm not just speaking to an empty seat, I'm speaking to you. And may the Holy Spirit speak to you through the word preached today, tomorrow, next week, and 
the following weeks so that until you go and see the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be encouraged in your heart through this word. And thirdly, we see the dedication of the temple, and we now go to verses 16 and 18. And I gotta say that when scholars read this portion, they often focus on the exact numbers of animals and sacrifices that were offered and compare that number to how much was offered during the days of Solomon. But I want to focus more on this one thing today, and that is the restoration of biblical offices according to the book of Moses. The restoration of biblical offices according to the book of of Moses. So we can't neglect this very important detail that the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the Jews now comprised the whole community of Israel or the people of Israel. And this is as important as the completion of the building. Because what has been important in God's co covenant life, the, the life under God's covenant, is not only about the completion of the temple but also the formation of God's people. Not only the completion of the building, but also the formation of the people. So I think in that sense, it's encouraging to hear that a new elder is, will be uh, inducted at all nations, which I believe is happening today. And this is another occasion for us to pray for our own elders, our own deacons, and, and ministers elsewhere as well. And I'm pretty sure that all of you are aware that um, in many places in Australia, there is a shortage of ministers. And so once again, I'd like to encourage you to pray that God will raise up leaders, that God would raise up those committed leaders who would, who would deliver God's word faithfully and to love the people with the loving heart of Jesus Christ. And so please let this be another occasion for you to pray and to encourage others around you to step up and to grow and serve uh, the people as a leader. Then lastly, we see the celebration of the Passover, and we go to verse 19 and following. And um, as we look at this last portion, let me ask one thing, and that is, why was it important? For the author to highlight the fact that the exiles ate the Passover lamb. Now, why was it important for the author to highlight that the exiles ate the Passover lamb? Because the word exile appears three times in verses 19 to 22. Is the author is intentionally hiding, hi highlighting that it was the exiles um, who participate in the Passover meal. Well, one importance was obviously that they, the exiles now, are trying to rehabilitate themselves to the ritual, the covenant ritual that God wanted His people to follow all along. Uh, they have been exiles, they've been living in foreign places for decades and decades, but now as they have finally returned to the Promised Land and the Holy City, Jerusalem, uh, they are now rehabituating themselves to the ritual that God wanted Israel to follow. They learned and, and habituated themselves to the pagan ways of life for years and years. But now as they came back to Jerusalem and became one nation and one assembly by God's grace, they were relearning the ways of giving thanks to God and of gathering together as one covenant community. And what thanks did they give to God as, to, as they celebrate the Passover meal together? We, we see in verse uh, 21 and 22 that they were seeking the Lord, the God of Israel, and thanking Him for, the, for changing the attitude of the kings of Assyria. Right? So, Perhaps as we end, I want to ask you this. Is your life patterned after the communal events that we regularly have in this congregation? Is your life well patterned after the ministries and events that we do here in this particular church? Just like the Jews did here in this context, we also gather together and celebrate the Lord's, Lord's Supper 
every week we get together to listen to the word of God preached and hear the, hear the word read and sang. Uh, we participate in this weekly ministry and we just habituate ourselves to that particular ministry. But perhaps sometime during the week you can do something else to again relearn and habit yourself to the ministries that we do. Um, or if you are part of different Christian communities and groups, perhaps you can do something with them too throughout the week, during the week. Um, and, and so I think it's important for us to consider as we read this portion to pattern our lives in such a way that the rituals and the events that God wants us to participate in are fully uh, uh, surrounded or, or they are surrounding our lives and, and shaping our lives in a very helpful way. But on, uh, above all things, uh, the basic line, uh, the baseline is that we should habituate ourselves to the Lord's Day worship that we have every Sunday. It is important that we get together um, as one's um, exiles and, and sojourners who are walking toward that heavenly Jerusalem. It is also important for us to habituate ourselves to the patterns and the rituals and the ministries that God wants us to uh, follow. Uh, and so I'd like to end today by encouraging you to come here every Lord's Day and be blessed by the Word and to encourage, uh, and to encourage you to participate possibly in other weekly ministries that we do so that your life could be enriched by the ministry of the Word Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday not only on Sundays. Let's pray.